and welcome to Metro Arts. I'm your host, Shana Fields-Clark, and here on Metro Arts, we highlight some of the best in the business. From fine artists, photographers, performing artists, cinematographers, as well as musical artists, all from the Metro Detroit area. On today's show, we have Associate Professor of Violin, Dr. Laura Roloffs, actor-comedian David Luther Glover, and artist Edward Strauss. <laughs> We're pleased to welcome Dr. Laura Roloffs, Associate Professor of Violin at Wayne State and the Director of the String Project at Wayne to Metro Arts. Hi, nice of you to join us. Hi, thanks for having me. Ah, so Dr. Roloffs, you've done many things. I have a list. You're a professor, you're a chamber of music performer, you're a concert master at Michigan Opera and directing of the String Outreach Program. Can you explain some of those roles and what have you taken from them? It's a big question. Yes. Um, <laughs> As, as you said, I do teach at Wayne State, so I have a studio of private students, and I teach, I coach chamber music, so I help uh, students learn to play in small groups on small ensembles. Um, I'm actually assistant concertmaster at the Michigan Opera Theater, um, which means that I play for the opera productions, and um, that's very exciting to be part of the big drama and the big picture, and a wonderful orchestra, wonderful colleagues, wonderful singers. Um, and I step in for the concert master when she needs me to. Okay. So it's kind of like an understudy position. Um, and then at the string project at Wayne, I have started a program which we'll speak about, I think, a little bit later, right? You were yes, going to ask me yes, about that a little later, so we'll get into more detail. But it's a string outreach program um, as part of Wayne State University. Wow. So can you tell us a little bit about the special project you're working with with uh, Wayne State? Because for you guys that don't know, Wayne State is a research school. So explain to us about that. I'm super excited about this project. Um, I'm actually on sabbatical this semester, which means I'm not doing teaching for mm -hmm. Wayne State. And instead, I have this research project to work on in my own performing skills. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually been to the Library of Congress in D.C., and I've been working with a group of pieces by an American composer named Charles Martin Leffler. You probably haven't ever heard of him. He died in 1935, and although he was extremely well-known before he died, he kind of went into obscurity after he died. So I've been working with manuscripts in his handwriting that probably haven't been played since he died, oh. and maybe haven't been played by anyone but him. And so I'm transcribing them into computer notation software and they're out of copy right now so I would be able to publish them performing editions and perform them myself and hopefully record them it's it's just a wonderful process it feels very intimate that's most definitely a great look absolutely yes okay so um, you're the founder of, um, and director of the uh, string project uh, at Wayne State can you tell us a little bit about that you mentioned before, though, actually. Yes, mm -hmm. the String Project at Wayne is, is, is a string outreach program that we founded in 2008. And we chose to do this because string projects in this area, string programs, I should say, in the schools mm -hmm. are closing down at an enormous rate. They're being cut, they're being trimmed, and there are fewer and fewer places that children can go for entry-level instruction. There are youth ensembles, but if you want to start from scratch, there's no place to go to do that in, for many, many children in this area. So that was one of the goals. But another goal that we have is to provide really excellent training for string teachers. So we have undergraduate teaching interns that are working with these children. Um, and so they learn from the children, the children learn from them, they learn and grow together. And that's great, definitely at a younger you know, age getting started. Exactly, they, they provide mentorship to the children and role modeling. And they become really, really good teachers. So when they leave Wayne State, they're already really, really skilled. And they can be passionate music advocates in the community. OK. And Dr. Roloffs, you uh, brought a clip with your students performing in last year's concert. Let's take a look.
And Dr. Roloffs, what can you tell us about the performance? Those were our level two students um, playing in May 2011. Those kids had been playing about a year and a half. So they were doing really, really well. They Absolutely. were taught by our a student intern, teaching interns. And I consider them my musical grandchildren because my students taught them. Aww, and I'm so <laughs> just as proud of them as any grandparent could be, almost like my home movies. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have one more clip um, that I brought and I wanted to just give your viewers an idea of the impact that this is having on the children themselves. So this is in the children's own words, the String Project children. Right. Well, let's take a look. Mm -hmm. How has the String Project affected you? Has it affected you positively? Okay. Everybody says yes. yes. All right, tell me how. Uh, when I listen to the radio and my mom turns it on to classical musical music, at first I didn't really want to hear it until I started playing it, and then I started to like it. So, yeah, it was a positive effect. Okay. What about you? It, it was a positive effect because my teachers that kind of inspired me, inspired me more to like one of the play instruments. I listened to the radio and I wanted to learn how to play what they were saying on the radio. It affected me in a positive way because when I'm looking back at my, co like my college resume, I'll have a lot of things to look back at. And we would like to thank Dr. Roloffs for appearing on Metro Arts on Detroit Public Television. <laughs> Our next guest is actor-comedian David Luther Glover. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. You? How are you? <laughs> yeah. I'm great. So yeah. tell us a little bit about how you got the name, the name you were given with. Oh, yeah. Well, I was given David Luther Glover. That's my name. Okay. You know? And then when I, I was, um, started off, branched off into comedy, mm -hmm. where people would stop me and ask me, you in the kin of Danny Glover? You in the kin of Danny Glover? You know, I hated that. So I dropped the Glover part. You know, you know. So the first time I dropped the glove apart, I'm in Livonia at a, at a comedy club. I tell the MC, I'm just David Luther now. David Luther, you got it? He said, I got it. Don't worry about got it. it. He introduces me, bring him out, a lot of applause. Martin Luther King. I said, Oh my God. How did you make that? How did you make that make you feel? Actually, it made me feel. It made me had a dream right then. You know. Well, you had a dream. You became what you are today. Yeah. Yeah, but you started off into acting. Right. So how did you make that transition? Well, you know, uh, acting, especially stage acting locally, you mm -hmm. know, there's not that many spaces. And big as I am, you know, you have to be kind of uh, uh, asked for in the script, you know, and it has to be a specific person. And so the, the roles were few and far between. I'm feeling sorry for myself. I heard Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. Well, Mark Ridley was on the radio, J.P. McCarthy's focus. Okay. And he mentioned his workshop for comedy. So I took the workshop and found out that I had a certain proclivity for uh, comedy. Mm -hmm. And what goes into comedy? Like, were you naturally born to just be, just be funny? Do you write jokes? How is that? Well, I write, I write stories from um, experience, you know, from what I see. What I try to do is get an audience to see the world through my eyes. Mm -hmm. And as simple as that, because I, I make no value judgments on anything mm -hmm. I say. I just tell people what I see. They look at me and they make the uh, uh, connection. That's absolutely, the mm -hmm. absolutely. So who are some of the most favorite people you've worked with in this business? Oh, well, I've worked with uh, probably one of your favorites, Screech. Oh, I love wow. <laughs> Right in Dearborn. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that was fantastic. But I have worked with <coughs> Gabriel Carter, Ka and, um, Dave Couillet. Mm -hmm. uh, and you told me before that you actually worked with the person who has your last name. Oh, yeah, I worked with Danny Glover right here, and I stood in for him in uh, Ypsilanti, but you were talking about comedy, and Danny yeah. wasn't standing Absolutely. there doing <laughs> Absolutely. comedy. But, yeah, I worked with Shy McBride, Antonio Fargus. I've been on the set with a lot more than... Uh, I can really recall right now. Wow, wow, David. So tell us, uh, what are some challenges about being a comic? Well, the biggest challenge, I did not realize that comedy, stand-up, is a young man's game. If, if you think about stand-up comedy, mm -hmm. you don't even see anybody approaching my age. Mm -hmm. I was well into my 40s when I first walked out on the stage to do stand-up, mm -hmm. talking about terrified. But I... Uh, I persevered, you know, it, it took me a while to figure it out because 
locally, you know, they're not, they can't get me to drive to, uh, let's say, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and on a Wednesday night in the, in the wintertime for a $200 gig. You know, Absolutely. I'm not going to do that. Okay, so we're... Um how do you feel? Do it, uh, your approach of intimidate people? Do you think, or do you have you ever like show somebody an audience to pick on and stuff no, like that? No, 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 no. no. I, I do a lot of white audiences, and they are between me and the door, and okay. uh, I, <laughs> I don't want to antagonize anything because I've had certain things yelled up at me mm -hmm. doing comedy. You know, people had a one strolls too many. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And David, what can we expect from you in the future? Well, I'm going to uh, hang around here and do what I do, whatever I can do, either stage work or I'm hoping the governor relents and gets some more film work here. I would hate to have to go back to Los Angeles. So oh, absolutely. It needs here. to come back here. Absolutely. Well, we thank you for coming on Metro Arts. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And up next, David will perform part of his comic routine. <laughs> Okay, I'm David Luther Glover, or David Luther, dependent. And I used to be known what's, what's known as an urban hick, an urban yokel, meaning before I started doing comedy, I never, never, never got out of the city. Well, that's not entirely true. After I bought my major appliances, I never, never, never got out of the city. But I have to tell you, things are different once you get outside the city, really. You get outside the city, you see some things you don't see in Detroit besides white folks, and tanning salons, and some putt-putt golf. But really, things are different in the suburbs. I remember the first time I'm in Royal Oak, I go into a delicatessen. A delicatessen, this delicatessen did not sell malt liquor or prepaid foam. There was no bulletproof glass. I looked at the fellow behind the counter. I said, you mind if I just touched you? He said, you must be from Detroit. My first big road trip was all the way to Petoskey. Petoskey, Michigan. You ever been to Petoskey? That black guy you saw was me. <laughs> because I was the only black man in Petoskey. And when you're the only black man in Petoskey, you are the only black man in Petoskey. I couldn't even buy menthol cigarettes in Petoskey. And I told you I was a hick, a yokel. I don't know anything about Petoskey, but a booking agent called me on the telephone and said, David Luther, can you get up to Petoskey? I said, of course I can go to Petoskey. I can go to Petoskey on my reputation. I had no idea where Petoskey was. I'm thinking, Petoskey, Petoskey. That's got to be near Hamtramck, you know? But really, you know, I'm having a good time out here. I, I really am. You know, I remember I, I'm in Oxford. Going into the club, a little lady behind me, she looked and she said, hi. I said, hi. She said, you're from Detroit. I said, what gave me away? I mean, I wasn't wearing my purple suit. And really, she said, oh, I know you're glad to be out of that city, all the hustle and bustle and crime. I said, yes, ma'am, I'm having a good time out here. She said, you know, you only got to worry about two things here in Oxford. Tornadoes and hitting a deer with your car. Ha, 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 ha. Scared the heck out of me. <laughs> I mean, I'm urban. I'm never given a split second thought of ever hitting a deer with my car. I don't know anybody ever hit a deer with a car. So I said, lady, what, can, what are you talking about? I can just drive out here and hit a deer? What's wrong with you people? Why don't you put your deers in your backyard? What's your civic pride? She said, what are you scared about, big boy? You got carjackers in the city. Yes, ma'am, we do, but not even the stupidest carjacker runs up and stops in front of your car. I mean, you know, it scared me. You know, in tornadoes, we don't get tornadoes in Detroit. We would have a white mare before we got a tornado in Detroit. So that night, I had a nightmare. And I'm telling you now, I have nightmares all the time because I was raised Catholic. I had a nightmare that I'm safe in my bed in Detroit. But a tornado picked up a deer in Oxford, flew up and dropped them on me and killed me. My family was too embarrassed to give me a decent funeral. They said, take his hands up to Oxford, but let us keep the deer. And then I read in the newspaper where they had found TB, tuberculosis, in deer in Michigan. Nightmare again. I'm driving to Oxford, a deer bolts out the brush. I can't avoid him. I hit him. He crashes through my windshield and coughs in my face. 
Thank you, that's my time, David Luther Glover, whatever. And now with the help of artist Edward Strauss, we'll be turning our Metro Arts set into an art studio. Welcome, Edward. Welcome. Hi, nice of you to join us here. Well, thank you for inviting me down here. I'm excited. Well, we see all the paint on your hands, so tell us a little bit about the uh, artwork that we're going to see today. Well, I don't know what I'm going to be actually doing. I think I'm just going to fiddle around, <laughs> and you can talk to me. I'll figure something out. Okay, so what is your inspiration behind this piece right here? Uh, this piece right here it was just uh, um, uh, a chance for me to uh, have some fun with and create some art that really doesn't need to make any sense. <laughs> uh, last time, I get customer work that, you know, I... Uh, they want something specific, you know. I like creating things that are just out of blue. Okay, so describe us to us um, your style. Uh, definitely, I'm independent, uh, and it's a. Uh, I work in uh, various mediums. Um, I work a lot of airbrush. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of portrait work. Uh, I paint a lot of angels. Um, I do sculpt. Um, I love charcoals. Okay. Uh, if I. So you say you do portraits, so right now you can draw me, basically. I can draw you, basically, oh, that yeah. that looks nice. <laughs> so where did you get your inspiration uh, be, uh, from to just come into artwork and start? Well, my, my grandfather was an artist. He uh, traveled the countryside painting uh, tobacco signs on barns. Okay. And uh, he, was a, he was also a portrait artist. Mm -hmm. Now, I know before uh, we just started, uh, when, before we got on set, you had told me that you, you started painting cars first. Yes. At the Motor City here, that's the way you make some money, painting cars. And I did that for a number of years because before I was able to afford my own studio. Okay. And uh, made good money painting cars. Mm -hmm. uh, the arts are the arts. Now, did you ever do anything like outrageous on a car? Uh, you know, they have one, like Pimp My Ride and stuff like that? I would like to, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I worked in dealerships and uh, I did a few things on my own cars and such like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what inspire you the most when it comes to your work? Do you have like that um, it comes, inspiration? Uh, uh, spirituality. Um, I like painting angels. I like painting things that are, are good, positive. There's some, some story behind it. Okay. Now, by becoming, like, from the automotive industry, have you ever painted the, the automotive world of Detroit? Um, well, I've painted uh, cars. Definitely I've painted cars. And I, they're, they're pretty much people. Okay. <laughs> That's an interesting way to think of cars. Oh, well, they, shape-wise, you know, they definitely take on the shape of the, uh, Just the you know, body, the human image body. Of, yeah, figures or whatnot. Okay, so um, if you had to choose three of your favorite artists, who would they be and why? Hmm, uh, well, Vincent Van Gogh. Okay, great. He uh, is a starving artist. He chose to paint what was in his heart, and uh, they're very inspirational to me. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Edgar Degas. I love his compositions, mm -hmm. and his, uh, his little ballerinas, uh -uh. Um, and uh, Bouguereau, he's a pretty, you know, he's an illustrator type of artist, and uh, I, I liked his, his detail. Okay. okay, and well, now you can add yourself to your favorite. <laughs> you always think of yourself as uh, your Well, I'm still working, I'm not dead yet, I still, I still have some things to prove. Absolutely. Now, over the years, how have you noticed, like, your artwork has changed? Um, it's getting looser. Okay. Uh, Explain that. Well, when I was younger, I thought, you know, creativity was detail mm -hmm. and precision. And it really isn't. Okay. As you show no, nothing, copying something perfectly uh, is, shows no artistic ability. Mm -hmm. Creativity, you put it that way. Um, if you want to say I dumbed down my style, then you can say that. But uh, I, I like... Um, I like to explore, you know, do different things, not the same thing over and over and over. Absolutely. Uh, now, I know um, you had said that uh, before the show that you never went to school physically to learn how to draw, but you like portraits and stuff. How, do you, how did you get that concept of like the critiques? Of, did, you, did you learn from a book? Someone taught you? Uh, well, well I, no one taught me. I basically, I studied. Uh, I did go to school, public school, and mm -hmm. I drew on the desk and I did everything the teachers told me not to. <laughs> said I can't make a living as a starving artist. Absolutely. And they're right, but um, I still do it. <laughs> uh, it's practice, you know. You go to school, uh, they throw you a book, and you have to learn theory, mm -hmm. and you have to practice. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing I did by myself, you know. I practice theory and art history. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone uh, wanted to become an artist, what advice would you give them? School. 
don't, don't do it my way. Uh, you get definitely get respect uh, quicker. Is it just respect that I'm um, going to school and learning to be an artist? Do or do you, do you have you ever felt that you don't get the respect by not going to school for it? Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, I hate to say that, uh, but I do get a lot of respect for you know who I am and Absolutely. the work that I do. And how are you, is your family supportive of your? Uh, oh, very art? much. They drove me here today. Uh, oh. Great. I choose not to drive because uh, um, I don't really see well anymore, and I would be a hazard to traffic. Explain the see thing. So how do you, you know, from seeing, from driving, uh, to see, I'm, to paint? I'm pretty, pretty much blind. Uh, I, can't really, I can't really see very well. I didn't know that, Edward. And, and a lot of people don't know about me. Uh, they, they said, you know, they all moved, they waved to me. I didn't see you. Well, I'm pretty sure you'll be an inspiration for people who are blind. And can, you can teach them, well, let them know that you can do anything, like even still paint and stuff like that. Exactly. I mean, the painting isn't going down the road 90 miles an hour. It's... It's basically uh, in front of me, so I can I can manage with that. It's my distance I really have my problems with. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, any children? Uh, two chihuahuas. <laughs> they, they are my they are my uh, my life. Well, I was gonna ask you. I was like, well, are you gonna pass this artwork down to your children? But I guess they're dogs. But you can put something on their paws yes. and have them go step on a picture or something. They work with me at the studio to every day to create their own art. Absolutely. So if people wanted to like. Uh, know where they can get your artwork from. Where can they contact you and well, get some of this inspiration? Um, I'm located at 28305 Gratiot in downtown Roseville. It's 11 and a half in Gratiot, uh, right in the corner. Um, I am listed in Yellow Pages. Uh, one can also just stop by anytime they want to. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty much here all the time. Mm -hmm. Not today, but any other time. <laughs> no, right now, Edward is on Metro Arts. <laughs> so have you ever had to do like, uh, what was like the most priciest painting you've ever done? Hmm, the most priciest painting I ever done. That was a few thousand dollars back in the day when the money was around. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, you know, I do some large scale murals. Mm -hmm. uh, but I live in, uh, in, work in, in, a, in a working class community and I work within the, uh, the people that, that are around me. Mm -hmm. And what, what, was, what is it that you had drawn that was really pricey? Uh, a family portrait. Okay. Oh, that seems awesome. Because now things are coming, you know, becoming digitally, you know. Yes. 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 Has that have that affected you in some type of way? Uh, no, not at all. Not me personally. Uh, I actually send a lot of people that way. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, that, that sounds like a job for uh, to be digitally done mm -hmm. versus, uh, you know, do it by hand. I mean, people don't really customize cars like they used to. They just, Absolutely. You know, paint on cars. They'll basically put uh, uh, the, the yeah. vinyl on there. You yeah. know, and yeah. that's great. You know. Uh, yeah. I said, I remember when it comes to cars, my grandpa used to custom lies his Calax. He loved, he loved the Calax. Yes. Yeah, you have the rims and the leather inside. So, yeah, mostly now I'm just driving Malibu that's already been made. So, <laughs> but definitely, like, people, how do you feel that people need to, like, appreciate their fine arts more? Uh, by going to the DIA, it's the best place. It's where I, I learned so much. I was just there on Thursday last it's week. It's the gem. I mean, it is the, we can't believe that it's in our own backyard. Mm -hmm. And so many people don't really necessarily understand the, the greatness of that building. There's more value in that one building there than any building in this whole. It's worth more than uh, Tiger Stadium and Ford Field over there. Absolutely. Uh, Comerica Park. And Edward, tell us a little bit about the work you've just done here. Well, I, this is a, an angel. And when I first came here, I didn't really have a plan what I was going to do. And then I seen you, and somehow or another, it started looking like you a little bit. Oh, it does look like me. G general, your general features. <laughs> Um, I like painting angels because uh, they are very, um, I don't know, very, very beautiful. Peaceful. Beautiful. Pe peaceful. I, I try to see goodness in everyone. Alrighty. Alrighty. And we would like to thank Edward Strauss for joining us here today on Metro Arts. <laughs>